Hi, my name is Kyle. I'm a media artist based in Los Angeles, and I'd like to introduce this masterclass to you where we'll cover some different approaches, including the history of machine learning, some different applications across various media, and a number of tools that I've been using recently to explore the world of machine learning. The first AI that left me speechless was a chatbot named MegaHal. It was 1999, and I read a transcript from a discussion with its creator, Jason Hutchins. It went like this. Tu parles français? I guess so. Parlez-vous français? In 1793, the French king was executed. Ha ha ha, correct. Although executed has multiple meanings. The revolution started on July 14. It is 14 degrees Celsius here. Another revolution was carried out by Lenin in Russia in the year 1917, while Lenin read a book. I was awestruck. It turns out that Megahal was basically sleight of hand. It was picking a single word from the user's input and then using a technique called Markov chains to kind of iteratively guess forward and backward from that word using a big corpus of text that the developer had collected. But for me, reading these transcripts had a huge effect on how I thought about computers and I got really excited about artificial intelligence. I felt some mixture of fear and delight in seeing this automatic system that was accomplishing something that seemed like it should be impossible to automate. There was some pleasure and trepidation, feeling like I was meeting an alien intelligence for the first time. That kind of imitation that's on display with MegaHal uh, continues to thrive in new machine learning research. And this technique here called style transfer is an example of imitating uh, artistic style instead of text style. For example, rendering the photo on the left as Van Gogh or Munch might have painted it, or rendering a sketch as a photo or a photo as a sketch. Uh, it seems like this should be, this should require a kind of a practiced artist, someone who went to school for years and studied, but in some sense, every kind of imitation can be reduced to a really repetitive learning process, and computers excel at repetition. Uh, this new research is typically built on neural networks, which I'm going to talk about a bit more. And here, uh, a researcher crafted this neural net that imitates Shakespeare. I'm going to read this. It says, uh, King Lear says, Oh, if you were a feeble sight, the courtesy of your law, your sight and several breath will wear the gods. With his heads and my hands, and wondered at the deeds, so drop upon your lordship's head, and your opinion shall be against your honor. Sounds really serious, right? But absolutely meaningless. <laughs> neural nets can also imitate speech from a specific person. Neural nets can also imitate speech from a specific person. This is an example from a company called Lyrebird, spoken using my voice. Beyond imitation, machine learning can answer some impressive questions, something as simple as, what's in this picture, a leopard? Or more open-ended questions like, how would you describe this picture? Two hockey players are fighting over a puck or very specific, like how many umbrellas are in this image? There are four umbrellas. Sometimes these algorithms seem superhuman, like the AlphaGo system that beat the world champion Go player in 2016, but they're not all perfect. They're built by humans, so they have very human failings. I really love this racist camera photo from Jaws Wang. In this case, Google Photos use the tag gorilla for photos of black people. <laughs> when an algorithm is designed to label images, uh, that opens up the possibility of incorrect labels. And those failures, when you look at those incorrect labels, reveal kind of the biases of the group that created it. Um, so in this case, it doesn't necessarily mean Google's a racist company or the people who made this are racist, but it, it probably means there weren't any black people working on this product. So I want to share kind of an overview of machine learning today. Um, machine learning is one approach to creating artificial intelligence. These words get kind of mixed up a lot, but I'm going to try and keep them straight. And then deep learning is a specific kind of machine learning that uses neural networks. So I'm going to give kind of high-level overview of what's happening in machine learning today. And I want to include some applications that are of interest to creative people, like everyone in this room, and then point to some tools that I use. Uh, let's 
try and break that down a little more. So these approaches to machine learning that I'm going to talk about, there's actually a lot more, but there's four that I want to talk about. Um, supervised, self-supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. My hope is that if I can give some overview of these very technical topics, that instead of just seeing new techniques coming out all the time, you'll have some vocabulary and kind of conceptual framework for looking at things and saying, oh, that's one of these, that's one of these things, and you'll know how they all fit together. Many machine learning algorithms are designed to operate on any kind of data, but I'm most interested in images, text, and sound, and I think probably a lot of you are too, so we're going to focus on those. And then finally, I'll wrap up with the tools that I'm using a lot in my work, um, including some standalone apps, uh, as well as some tools designed for programming languages like Python and JavaScript. Quick detour about me. My work takes a bunch of different forms, including interactive installations, uh, sneaky interventions, workshops, uh, toolkits for other artists working with code. Um, I really love exploring the possibilities of new technologies and understanding how they affect uh, society and trying to like build alternative futures with them. I like to make people laugh. I like to collaborate with my friends. I like to spark some curiosity or create confusion, um, make spaces with magical vibes. Some of my work's like really huge and impressive. It's a spectacle, like this is Social Soul uh, with Lauren McCarthy. Um, visitors enter this room where 50 monitors surround them with all of their social media. Um, and then some of my other work creates kind of fleeting connection between people, like sharing faces. This is a co-located installation uh, that matches the expression of visitors from one place to those of another. Um, sometimes my work's more of a study in craft and aesthetics, uh, like light leaks, where we use computer vision algorithms that are originally designed for 3D scanning to projection map millions of reflections from dozens of disco balls. The producer for this project's right over here, actually, Juliette Bibas. <laughs> I also do technical and creative consulting, building machine learning powered synthesizers or analyzing terabytes of humpback whale songs. It, it's kind of diverse practice. Okay, let's get into the machine learning. Machine learning is often in service of some decision. People use machine learning algorithms to help automate some decision. Let's say we've got a plant, right? My mom just gave me uh, an orchid recently and I have no clue how to take care of it. <laughs> so I had to read a lot and I realized this was a good metaphor for what happens with machine learning. Let's say you've got a plant and you need to decide how to take care of it, um, how much light it needs, uh, when to water it, to trim it, to feed it, right? One solution is to just get a bunch of plants just like that one and just kind of try out random things, right? See what works, what sticks, which ones die, which ones live. Eventually, you'll find some approach that allows that plant to thrive, right? Hopefully. Um, that's called random search, if you just kind of try everything out. Uh, you can also try that out a little bit and then take the best uh, scripts or schedules or strategies and try and combine them. That's called evolutionary algorithms. Um, these are sort of adjacent from neural networks, but you might hear these phrases like evolutionary algorithms, random search, um, when uh, people are talking about kind of learning in the world, situations where you don't have training data, but you've got to figure out how to act. Um, so more broadly, if we're trying to make decisions based on the state of the environment, uh, like Maybe we watch for the soil to dry instead of just following a blindly set schedule. That's called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is really useful in situations where the goal is clear, like you want to get the ball into the goal or you want the character to walk. But uh, the best decision depends on the context and it can't really b be described easily. You can't just like program it out or explain it really obviously. Um, so the video game toolkit Unity has a really popular tool for this kind of reinforcement learning called ML agents. Uh, if you want to teach a digital character to walk or a robot arm to pick up objects, reinforcement learning can be applied to the joint motion and you can figure this out iteratively faster than doing a random search, faster than doing some kind of evolutionary combining the best strategies approach. Google's developed a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms through DeepMind that play board games like chess and Go, video games like StarCraft, and they even solve some real-world problems like controlling an entire data center to minimize energy consumption. When I saw this research, it really made me wonder what it will look like when an entire city or an entire country is optimized in this way. 
Another approach is to just figure out what the name of the plant is. <laughs> And then we can look up the information we need, right? That's kind of the obvious thing to do in retrospect. Other people have done that research to figure out what the right watering strategy is. So let's build up a data set. We'll need to make some kind of note of the different features of the plant and somehow use those features, like maybe the petal size or the um, leaf width or the color, to predict the plant's name somehow. Maybe we could just make a like really simple set of instructions, like if the plant's flowers are red, it's hibiscus, but this won't be very accurate, <laughs> and it's going to take a long time to write all the rules that we need to classify our plants correctly. So instead, what we want is a system that can just learn from examples. Okay? Instead of carefully writing rules, we just need to collect more examples. Each example is something that has a set of features, like leaf size, leaf shape, petal color, and then a name. And if we have enough examples, then we can do a kind of comparison. Um, the features are the input, and the name is the output. Once we collect enough examples, then we can check all of the examples that we've already collected to see which one's most similar to the thing that we have. Right? This is called the nearest neighbor algorithm. This can work really well for small data sets uh, when there's only a few features to check. This is one of the simplest machine learning algorithms. For bigger data sets with lots of features, nearest neighbors can be kind of slow or inaccurate, and it doesn't necessarily take the best advantage of all the nuance in the data. One way around this is to automatically build a set of rules that, when followed correctly, classifies the flower. So it's kind of like that code we wrote before, like checking this or checking that. Um, but instead of writing it manually, we have uh, something that generates that automatically. And that's usually called a decision tree. At its core, machine learning is just this process that I just described of programming with examples instead of instructions. Normally, we write code, but with machine learning, we give examples. That's about it. End of talk. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, sometimes these algorithms can be very simple, like the ones I just gave. Naming a flower is one kind of machine learning task called classification. That's a categorical, categorical prediction. It's like a this or that or that or that. If you want to make a numeric prediction, that's called regression. Uh, so if you hear that word, that's all it means. It just means something continuous, something varying. We're trying to fit that. Instead of a this or that thing, it's a continuous thing. If we want to predict whether there's rain or sun tomorrow, that's classification. If we want to predict what the temperature is going to be, that's regression. One of the simplest solutions to a regression problem is line fitting, which we probably learned in high school. If we want to predict like an animal's brain weight from their body weight, this is a kind of a classic semi-pseudoscience relationship. Um, we can plot a bunch of examples in two dimensions and then draw a line through it. And now we've got a kind of model, like that line is a model of the relationship between these two things. So some researchers describe line fitting as the oldest kind of machine learning, going back to the early 1800s. So if you've got two inputs and one output, uh, you can't just fit a line, then you have to fit kind of a plane to it. Does that make sense? Like, you've got a surface and there's different points here that have values, and you have to fit something through that in 2D. And then it gets more complex as you go into more dimensions. Instead of just having maybe body weight and height, maybe you also have uh, um, body weight and height and, um, I don't know, uh, when it last split off from the evolutionary tree or something like that. And it gets more and more complicated. You have to fit higher dimensional surfaces. But the same concept applies of like line fitting. So this kind of fitting is almost equivalent to a single neuron in a neural network. So now we're, we're getting to the neural networks. <laughs> a fit line described by the equation, you might have heard y equals mx plus b. That's where you have a uh, like x value that's varying, like the body weight. And then you have some m, which is like describing the slope of the line. And then the b, which is the offset, this kind of bias value. Um, you multiply the slope by m, the value uh, slope m by the value x. Add b and get the output y. This is exactly the same as a single neuron with a single input. If we add another input to the neuron, it looks like this, right? Just a little more complicated. We're just adding another x value with its own slope, and we can just keep doing that. And that's all a neuron is inside a neural network. More generally, a neuron just has inputs that are weighted by some value, and the weighted values are added together and finally offset by some amount. Modern neural networks combine and stack 
thousands of neurons, and each neuron has hundreds of inputs. Sometimes these weights are tied together, um, and the kind of relationships between all these values can get really complicated, um, but this is the basic principle. So these neural networks can be trained using a technique called gradient descent that incrementally changes those weights, kind of tweaks them slowly and offsets until the model outputs predictions that are more correct than they were before. And gradient descent relies on another technique called backpropagation uh, to determine what incremental changes should be made. So if you hear those terms, that's all it's describing. It's just the way to tweak those weights so that it models the thing that you're trying to model. Another way you can visualize it is it's this line that's slowly getting fit or this plane that's slowly getting fit. Google has this interactive visualization of uh, gradient descent with backpropagation on their TensorFlow Playground website. And uh, I think it's a really good way to get a feeling for what's going on with um, this system. So they've got uh, each of these little boxes as a neuron, and you can see the inputs going into it and the outputs flowing out. Um, and what it's trying to do is take some input points in 2D and classify them as blue or yellow. This approach for training neural networks was popularized by this guy, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, in 1986. And he was basically shunned by conferences and journals for decades because no one ever thought neural networks would be useful. They kind of didn't believe him. But in the 2000s, some really big changes brought neural nets into the mainstream. And researchers started calling it deep learning. They tried to rebrand it. These changes were kind of in the data, the algorithms, and the hardware. And that data came from sort of rise of social media and surveillance capitalism, which meant that companies like Google and Facebook had access to more data than ever before. And uh, deep learning was really the only way to effectively put it to use, basically. Not all of these companies were complicit, <laughs> but they were enabling. So Flickr, for example, was uh, basically the reason that image classification took off, but it's not necessarily something they were trying to do. <laughs> the algorithms evolved uh, even in really fundamental ways. So adding simple functions to the output of neurons, instead of just being a line that's output after you add all those weights together, you can take like the maximum value between that and zero. So it has a kind of like shape like this, or you can process it through like some kind of arc so that it smoothly increases instead. Turns out, if you just make small changes to the way that neuron works, that it can have really big effects when you add all of these neurons up. There's other weird tricks, like they started, some researchers realized during the training process, if you randomly just like delete neurons temporarily, it turns out that the whole neural network is way more resilient <laughs> at the end, which sounds counterintuitive. Like, why would it make sense that, you know, c creating problems would create a better result? But I don't know. I guess there's some theory in there about adversity. It turns out it works. In terms of hardware, uh, in the late 2000s, researchers started using graphics cards, which are also called graphics processing units or GPUs, to train their networks. And the speed difference between training on the GPU and what they were doing before, the CPU, uh, so big that it meant they could train more complex networks for much longer and produce better results. The moment that caught everyone's attention, though, was in 2012. There's a very specific moment when a team of researchers won this challenge called ImageNet uh, using neural nets. And um, the task for ImageNet was to predict the name of an object in a photo from a thousand different possible categories. If you did this with random search, you're useless. You have a one in a thousand chance of getting it right. So you've really got to like use all the data effectively. So after a few years of older machine learning algorithms winning similar challenges, uh, <laughs> this new team won by a landslide. So I don't know if you can see them, if everyone can see them down here, but like that's where everyone was before. And even in that year, they were using older machine learning techniques called SVMs and feature extraction. And then the deep learning people came in and they like totally halved the error rate. Um, can anyone guess who co-authored the paper? This guy, Jeffrey Hinton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> One of the most important ingredients in their solution, uh, and in all of the image-based work I'm showing today, is something called convolution. So convolution means finding the overlap between a chunk of data and a sliding filter called a kernel. Um, this is an example of a one-dimensional convolution. One dimension just means along the line. 
In this case, the blue line is our data, and that kind of orange line uh, is the kernel, and the yellow overlapping area um, creates this black line. That's the output of the convolution. You can also think of this as like a moving weighted average, where the kernel is a set of weights, and you're just kind of multiplying all those weights by the function, the blue function at each step. So you can see as that yellow area increases, then the line goes up, and then it goes back down. With images, we can also do this. We do what's called a two-dimensional convolution. So instead of just sliding a window like this, we slide it across the whole image. Um, this means finding the overlap between the pixels of this small kernel and the pixels of this big input image. Depending on the pixels in the kernel, the output could be a blurred version of the input or a version where the edges are highlighted or something else. Um, another way to think about this is that the output will highlight things that look similar uh, to the kernel. So if the kernel's a horizontal line, then the output is going to have all the horizontal lines highlighted. Um, when, com when these convolutions are used inside neural networks, they're called convolutional neural networks. Uh, convolutional nets apply different convolutions one after another. So it doesn't just do it once and get like an edge filter or do it once and get a blurred image. It does it once and then again to the processed image and again to that processed image and again. And these are each called layers of processing. Um, in some sense, these convolutional nets are learning kind of two things at the same time. One is patches of images or kernels that help discern the difference between categories. Um, something like, uh, I don't know, like um, the patches on the leopard we saw earlier, that's a specific pattern. And you could kind of find a set of kernels that describes that pattern. And they get really high output when they are across that pattern. And then another set of kernels that, you know, when it sees uh, like a leafy plant, it dis it activates totally differently and it, uh, it really lights up. Um, so the neural nets are kind of optimizing themselves to uh, respond to each of these things as appropriate. It also does it in a kind of um, multi-level, like hierarchical way. So first, at the lowest levels, it learns to detect things like edges or spots. Um, and then a combination of like maybe an edge and like a dark spot might make up an eyebrow and an eye. Um, and then finally, it will recognize like an eyebrow and an eye and a nose are part of a face. It sort of combines these things on each step as it does this convolutional processing. Sometimes it's really hard to untangle where a net is detecting features and where it's kind of combining them. Um, it was maybe 15 years of people using these convolutional networks before good visualization techniques started to be developed so that we could kind of see inside them to know what was happening. If you want to understand this better and like look inside convolutional neural nets, I really recommend this video from Jason Yosinski. Um, where he walks through what all the different convolutions inside a neural network are seeing. Okay, we just talked about reinforcement learning, supervised learning, which is when you have a data set of inputs and outputs that you need to match, like classification or regression. Let's talk about self-supervised learning. All the supervised learning techniques rely on these large, carefully crafted, labeled data sets, like you know, a million images and a million labels for ImageNet. But sometimes it's possible to create a label automatically if you're really clever about it. So for example, in the case of images, you can take like a perfectly normal image and then remove a section of it. And then you can create the reverse task where you say, I want a convolutional network to predict this image from that one. This is called in-painting, this specific case. Uh, and if you can learn this on your data, then in theory, you could take another image where you really don't know what's there and feed it to the network, and it should be able to figure out what might be there. Um, that'd be pretty neat, right? Well, it turns out it basically works because the training data was generated automatically. This is called semi-supervised learning. Um, so it follows a similar process to a supervised learning uh, problem, but the training data is generated in a very different way. OK, finally, unsupervised learning. OK, in unsupervised learning, the goal is to find patterns in otherwise unstructured data. You don't have labels. You, don't really, you can't like, extract labels from it in a semi-supervised way. So imagine a kid walking into a pet store and just not knowing the names of the different animals. At some point, they're going to be like, 
okay, there's at least three kinds of animals in here, right? They're gonna be like the cats, the dogs, and the birds. They're pretty different from each other. <laughs> um, I know they're different, and the dogs are all similar to each other, the cats are all similar, and the birds are all similar to each other. Um, but those categories are different from each other. So this idea of like kind of finding groups, in machine learning that's called clustering. Um, and this is one kind of unsupervised learning algorithm I'm gonna use to um, give you a feeling of like what unsupervised learning means. Um, one of the clustering algorithms is called uh, k-means clustering. Uh, and it starts by taking some data set. In this case, we have like a two-dimensional data set. Every point has like a position in 2D space, and that's all we know. And then it randomly places however many clusters we think there might be. In this case, I told it, I think there's three clusters because we walked into the store and that was our intuition. Before it moves the clusters, it identifies the points that are close to the clusters already, and then it moves the cluster centers to the average position of those points. And it does this iteratively until eventually it converges on some solution that it doesn't change from until there's no more changes to be made. So this is a really simple algorithm. Um, I think if you've, if you've written some code before, you could probably imagine how to implement this in a couple dozen lines of code. This isn't like, um, uh, this isn't some advanced like neural network processing thing, but it's actually really powerful. Uh, so for example, if you treat each pixel in an image as a 3D point, then you can use this k-means algorithm to find uh, kind of the dominant colors in an image. So in this case, this was like, we fed in the screen to k-means by taking each pixel out of the image and treating it as a point in a 3D RGB space, right? And then we say, we want, uh, let's see, I guess 10 clusters and it initializes them randomly and it starts just keep moving them until it converges on something that it doesn't need to move from anymore. And it turns out these are the dominant colors in this image. It's pretty neat for such a basic algorithm. Another kind of unsupervised learning is called dimensionality reduction. <laughs> While clustering picks a single cluster for each data point, dimensionality reduction provides a small set of numbers describing each data point. So this technique's most useful on data that's very high dimensional. So what that means here is like, we're, f we're all familiar with like a 2D point or like a 3D point. Once you get higher than 3D, um, researchers normally call it high dimensional data. And what they really mean is probably something with hundreds of dimensions. Something that you can't really, like it makes no sense to visualize it. You just talk about it as if it were dimensional because that's what they like to do. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey Hinton actually says, yeah, whenever I'm trying to think of uh, very high dimensional data, I just think of three dimensions, and then I repeat to myself, 100 dimensions, 100 dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have like a 10 by 10 pixel image, um, you can think of that as like a 100 dimensional data point. There's 100 numbers in that image, right? Like a grayscale 10 by 10 pixel image. So that's all they mean when they say high dimensional, Sometimes they're just talking about images. Um, sometimes there's some other kind of data that has a lot of ways that it can vary. Uh, okay, so usually dimensionality reduction outputs 2D points or 3D points because mostly people are using dimensionality reduction to create some kind of visualization. Let's say you've got uh, a bunch of images, like um, uh, handwritten digits, I'm gonna show you in a second. You wanna create a plot of these images. So similar things are nearby, and dissimilar things are far apart. Um, you can think of these points as um, kind of projection of the data. Um, that's a word people use to describe this, or an embedding of the data. Um, I think the reason they say projection is like, imagine a 3D point cloud, or like, um, imagine a tree in winter, right? It's really complex 3D form, but as the sun shines through it and it casts a shadow on the ground, it's a projection of that form and it flattens down to 2D, right? So w when researchers say that dimensionality reduction is a projection of high dimensional data, I think that's what they're imagining is like something that exists in a high dimensional space with kind of light coming through it, creating a shadow in two dimensions. 
Okay, so when we plot these embeddings, some structures can emerge, which is pretty neat. One of these dimensionality reduction algorithms is called principal components analysis, or PCA. That one's kind of boring, so we're going to talk about the exciting ones. <laughs> but PCA outputs embeddings with really strong global structure. Um, my favorite dimensionality reduction algorithms give really kind of complex local structure. Um, with really like fine-grained details. So this is an example from an algorithm called TSNE, um, and it embeds similar data close together and dissimilar data far apart. So in this case, it took uh, 70,000 handwritten digits, little 28 by 28 pixel images, and it projected them all down from 768 uh, dimensions all the way down to two dimensions um, in a way that similar things are close and dissimilar things are far apart. So if we zoom in, we can see an area where the fives and the threes and the eights, fives and threes and eights, they all kind of meet in the middle. Um, this is kind of impressive because the algorithm doesn't know which digits are which. It wasn't ever given any labels. All it sees is images, just 28 pixel by 28 pixel images. We never gave it any labeled information. It's just grouping them based on how they look. And it kind of makes sense that they all meet in this place because the threes and the eights are kind of similar to each other. You can even see some weird ones like up here. Like, what is that? Really? <laughs> Who wrote that one? <laughs> Let's talk about applications and with focus on images at first. OK, so we already talked about image classification, where you recognize the category of an image, right? maybe across a 1,000 categories. Image classification normally fails on complex images. So if I took a picture of all of you right now and I asked what's the category of this image, it would give me something like Band-Aid, probably, because it sees like the, you know, the wood color and that there's some straight lines. And <laughs> I get Band-Aid a lot. Sorry, so I'm projecting. <laughs> Whenever I point it at me, it says Band-Aid. Sometimes I get um, like a uh, suit. <laughs> if I'm wearing like a collared shirt, it tells me I'm a suit. Uh, <laughs> so what you really want to do in a complex scene is use an algorithm called object detection. One of these object detection algorithms is called you only look once or YOLO. <laughs> and it's of special interest to all you folks who are doing some kind of interactive work because YOLO is designed to run in real time, which is pretty neat. I think in this case, they're running it a little faster than real time because they're doing some like post-processing on the images. But you can run it at 30 frames per second on HD data, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, that was funny, sports ball. <laughs> For outlines, if you want like more detailed information than just a bounding box, there's another technique called object segmentation. So both the detection and the segmentation, these are image analysis techniques, right, for producing predictions about an image. But most creative people working with neural nets right now are using them to create images directly, right? Not just analyzing images, but trying to generate images. You might have seen some artists working with some psychedelic technique called Deep Dream back in June of 2015. The idea here was to take what a classifier, an image classifier, sees and then make small adjustments to the image to increase the probability of the classifier seeing that thing. So if the classifier sees a dog in some region, then Deep Dream's going to modify the image a little bit to make it more dog-like. So maybe it saw a dog like right here. Actually, it kind of saw a dog everywhere. Yeah. And then it sort of tweaks the pixels in the image one step at a time to make it kind of respond, oh, more dog-like, more dog-like. Um, and maybe you can guess like some other things it might have seen elsewhere here. Like down here, this feels really like caterpillary, and these are like eyes. There's some kind of, there's some dude up here. <laughs> I, this looks like a really like demon taxi or something, I don't know. You know, we get to also then look at these images and project what we see, which is kind of fun. After enough iterations of Deep Dreams, then we're kind of left with these monstrosities as the output. For me, Deep Dream is incredibly beautiful from a theoretical perspective because it's one of the first techniques to really show us what was happening inside a convolutional neural network. Using Deep Dream to visualize specific objects like uh, lifting weight or dumbbell, um, it becomes kind of clear that the network hasn't really learned to separate the object from the context that it sees it in. So in this case, it, researchers wanted to generate image of different categories. And when they got to dumbbell, they saw, oh, there's always this hand attached to it, kind of disembodied floating hand. The neural net doesn't know about bodies in this case, but it does know that hands are always attached to dumbbells. <laughs> Another 
popular direction is that style transfer technique that I mentioned earlier. Um, Helena Seren mixes style transfer with her own drawings and paintings. I really like her work. Both the deep dream and style transfer are not really machine learning algorithms per se, but uh, they both use trained neural networks to augment existing images. Some people would describe it as a kind of optimization process instead of a learning process. Sophia Crespo also works with a lot of biological and scientific imagery augmented with style transfer. But easily the most popular image generation technique is the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN, which was introduced in 2014 by a researcher named Ian Goodfellow. Uh, the generative part uh, is because once this network is trained, it can produce images without any input. And the adversarial networks part is because uh, it uses two neural networks that are kind of competing with each other in a cat and mouse game, like a cashier and a counterfeiter, where one's trying to fool the other into thinking that it has a real example, like it has real money, right? And the other one's trying to distinguish real from fake, like is that a real, you know, $100 bill? Um, so GANs are kind of unsupervised learning algorithm, uh, right? There's no labels here. We just have a bunch of data. We're trying to create some imitation of that data. Uh, and they're using convolutional networks for both the generator and the discriminator. Uh, and then when you're done training this whole process, you can just drop the discriminator, basically, and then you have this generator left over which can create arbitrary images in the style of the original real data. So there's a bunch of artists working with this, and I'll mention a few. Um, Anna Riddler uh, has been doing this kind of conceptual work around GANs. Um, that's about uh, thinking of them as a virus, and then also AI as this kind of new tool at Mania. Uh, Jason Sullivan has been making apps that use GANs in a kind of mosaic context. Mario Klingemann uh, has doing, been doing all kinds of collaborations and work with GANs, especially around portraiture. Um, Pierre Wieg uh, just recently got into it, which is surprising always to see contemporary artists pick up what's happening in media art. Sarah Friend, I really like this project she made where she scraped a ton of images from social media and started generating imaginary social media. Scott Eaton's work is messed up. <laughs> This is from some project where he just poured like some, I think, green screen paint or something on his hands, and then he uses that to generate uh, imagery from a network he trained um, on kind of bodies, human bodies, so he can kind of control the bodies and with his hands. By the way, this image that I showed earlier as the real data, I lied, it's not real data. It was actually generated by a GAN called StyleGAN. A lot of these images might look perfect. These are all generative images. These were all made by a GAN. But if you look closely, there's still some hints that they're artificial. So teeth can be a little weird. If you look really closely at the teeth, there's like a... <laughs> what is that? My hair doesn't really do this, but maybe someone else, like just kind of hangs there. It, the, the GAN never figured out like, oh, hair needs to be connected to the head, right. And there's this one little kind of wormhole looking artifact that no one has really been able to explain to me. I noticed it in the same place in multiple images generated by style GAN, but it's not really clear what it is. I have some suspicion that it might be like a earring that's ready to evolve. Like the GAN wants to put an earring there, but it's not quite sure if it should or not. That's my suspicion, I don't know. If you are into this kind of surreal aesthetic, I recommend checking out GAN Breeder, which is really quick. Just You can go to the website and start clicking on things and try and generate and like navigate what's called the latent space of the GAN. So whenever you generate one of these images, um, you can think of, uh, the space of possible images as being super high dimensional, okay? And uh, let's say it's a thousand dimensional, right? That's not the number of pixels in the image. That's something else. It's a kind of, uh, it's an embedding itself of the image that the GAN maintains internally. So as you work with GAN Breeder, then you're basically tweaking those dimensions and kind of traveling through this embedding space um, where th things that are looking similar are next to each other and things that look different are far away from each other. 
Uh, Pix to Pix is another image generation approach that operates on a completely different principle than the GANs do. So it takes image pairs. It's a supervised problem, right? You have to have an input and an output. And then Pix to Pix learns how to convert from one image to the other using convolutional networks. In these cases, we've got like converting from labels of cars driving around to a picture of cars driving around, uh, a picture from satellite imagery to a uh, kind of labeled street map, or labels of a facade to a picture of a facade. Some of these are supervised, right? Like this case where we have uh, data that, like, where else are you going to get this kind of data from unless you take recordings and then mark them up? Well, actually, sorry, that's not totally true. One trick is you can make a game engine, like uh, get GTA, and then just have it generate both a render and the label image. Some researchers work with synthetic data like that, but usually this would be a supervised problem, right? But some of the pairings are semi-supervised. So in this case, you can actually generate that image from that image. Remember I showed that earlier where you just kind of generate one way and then flip the arrow? So in this case, the training data starts with a bunch of pictures of handbags, right? And then they do some really basic, like, you know, same thing you can do in Photoshop, but some basic computer vision to just generate these edgy images. And then you've got a big data set of from these edges generate something that's photo-like. So anything that's a set of photos that's kind of self-consistent, you can do this with. Um, so you can generate photo-like images from drawings of cats or whatever this thing is. <laughs> and deep fakes, if you've seen those, they're also built on top of pix to pix With deep fakes, what they do is they take a pix to pix architecture and the input is one person's face and the output is another person's face. So in this case, the input image was the face of the actor uh, or actress, I don't know, and the output was the face of Dolly. And the way that they paired these images up is they used some kind of traditional face analysis techniques to find two photos in these big data sets that matched. So let's say there's a picture in some archive of Dolly going, and then the actor, at some point, they recorded a bunch of data in advance, and at some point in that recording, the actor also goes, and the face analysis m finds these two images, and it maps them up, and it puts them into pics to pics together. And it just does this enough that you can generate deep fakes. Let's focus on faces for a minute. So a lot of this research is really neat and helpful, but some of it's kind of blatantly dangerous. This research paper used profile photos from a dating website combined with data about the profile's gender and the gender of the person that they were looking for to train a neural net to predict sexual orientation from photos, which they define in this paper as either same-sex or opposite-sex attracted. They found that the model worked really well in the context of their data, uh, and then they use this to make these really questionable connections between sexual orientation and biological factors like prenatal testosterone levels. There's a lot of danger in kind of blindly using these algorithms to kind of push whatever narrative that you're already excited about. Other researchers are attempting to predict whether someone's a criminal based on their appearance. So one of these rows is uh, criminal faces and the other is non-criminal faces. So just See if you can guess for a second. Which ones are the criminals, which ones are the non-criminals? Let's see how our neural networks do. Okay, everybody got a guess? So who thinks it's the top row is the criminals? Okay, and then er who thinks the bottom row is the criminals? Okay, so we all pretty much agree it's the top row. So it turns out you're right, the top row is the criminals. <laughs> Uh, but there's something that seemed really strange when I read this in the paper. Does anyone notice like a big difference between the top row and the bottom row? The background color is totally different. The criminals have a white background and the non-criminals have a gray background, which I guess means that if you're spotted in China on a surveillance camera and you don't want to get caught, just wear a hoodie. <laughs> and it'll be like, oh, he's got a gray background. <laughs> Other researchers rate how attractive someone is based on their appearance. So for me, this really hammers home what's wrong with this situation. We're all really good, actually, at judging each other. We do it all the time, every day, since we're kids. 
and uh, we judge each other based on how we look, how we act, and we even agree, like just a minute ago, about who is and isn't this thing or that thing, who's attractive or who looks like a criminal, but I don't think that this is necessarily a good feature of humanity. I don't think that just because this is a feature of our intelligence that we should be automating this intelligence. I don't wanna just bake this into AI. I don't think we should automate it. Uh, I think this history we have of creating taxonomies and trying to categorize people based on the way that they look um, from scientific racism to physiognomy, the Chinese face reading, it feels to me like every time we try to pick a category to describe other people, it kind of pushes us farther apart rather than bringing us together. So I've been thinking about this question a lot. What features of humanity do we want to automate? Maybe not something like making assumptions about people based on how they look, even though that's something we do a lot. It's some kind of feature of our intelligence. I don't know that we want to automate that. But there are some other things I would like to see automated, like uh, some positive aspects of humanity. For example, uh, being open to change in ourselves or being open to change in other people um, or being able to put other people before ourselves. I would love to see those things automated in some kind of thinking, feeling system. So I wanna give some specific examples of facial analysis um, so you can have a little more to think about here. I think that faces are kind of automatic analysis of faces is one of the fastest ways that some of this technology can be weaponized against us. So I think it's important to understand it. I've been personally trying to recreate some of this research as best as possible, like the criminal detection, the uh, sexual orientation detection. Some of it's really easier, like the facial expression detection. Uh, most researchers agree that there are six main ways we use our face to communicate. Seems pretty simple, right? Happiness, fear, sadness, anger, surprise, contempt, and kind of neutral, like this sort of off class. Okay, so let's say I'm looking at my facial expressions, right? Um, if I just kind of move my ma mouth around a little bit, I can get some of these. Like I can get, there's anger, I'm kind of getting it there. Yes, all right, success. Let's see what else I've got. Disgust is a really difficult one. I, oh, th there it is, all right. <laughs> just pop it up a little, all right, let's try fear. Uh, I think fear has something to do with like mouth open and eyebrows up. That, it just popped in for a moment. Contempt is really the most difficult though. Disgust is like medium compared to contempt. Contempt is somehow asymmetric and I've never really been able to master it, but it's like <laughs> something like that. When you look at like the average in the data set, it looks like that. Okay, doesn't feel too creepy, right? It's kind of funny, like, oh, computer's trying to understand my expression. But then as you get into other data sets and you use the exact same technique with different labels, you start to feel really different about it, right? Like, why is Chubby all the way over there? <laughs> uh, some of these are just totally wrong, right? I, it got my hair right, I guess. It, doesn't think I have receding hairline, that's nice. Pointy nose, maybe. <laughs> what else have we got here? Teeth not visible, so that's pretty accurate. I can kind of toggle that one just by making my teeth visible or not. Color photo, okay, fair enough. Attractive man is all the way down there. <laughs> that's not fair. So again, I think it feels really dangerous when machines make some of these decisions. Those expressions, it doesn't feel so wrong, right? It just feels kind of funny and like maybe there's some positive use. Maybe like we can use that to like help machines understand like where we are right now and that the volume needs to be turned down because I'm not making a happy face or so something like that. I don't know. But uh, in that last example, you might have noticed some other categories like black or Indian and those feel particularly problematic to me. I don't want a machine to tell me something that I should be telling it about myself, right? There's some things that seem fair to describe about other people from a distance, like the expression they're making, because that's for communication, right? Other people's identity doesn't seem like something that we should be projecting onto them, and especially not in an automated way. So I've been trying to reproduce all of this research as accurately as possible to understand what kind of trade-offs these researchers have to make. Um, and what assumptions they have in their process that they don't really write about. So one of these data sets I was working with includes two million faces mined from Flickr with geotagged locations. The researchers who compiled this data set are interested in predicting where someone 
was, was when the photo was taken, which maybe you can imagine what that's a proxy for. What does that mean? Like, where does it look like this person was when the photo was taken? That, it's basically a proxy for some kind of ethnicity or race. Here's some average images from the researchers kind of spread across the globe in different areas. You can see like some very fair-skinned people up here and some darker-skinned people down here. It sort of matches some of our preconceptions about how these averages might play out. Um, so the first step in reproducing their research was to divide all of these two million photos into 20 geographic subregions. Um, and so this image shows the averages of each subregion. And then I trained a neural net to identify which subregion a face is from. Once I had a really similar accuracy to the original research paper, then I would ask the neural net to show me what's the most representative photo from each of these subregions. So I check all of the photos and I'd see which one got the highest scores for this subregion. So I would ask, for example, who looks the most Central African out of all these photos? And then it would reply, this guy. Sort of surprising. How is this guy the most Central African, according to the neural net? And how is it only him? <laughs> I would expect there to be some other people in like the top most Central African people in this data set. So I thought maybe I made a mistake. You know, I'm just getting started with this stuff. That's probably a bug. I looked through my code so much and really checked my results against theirs. And um, I looked at their, uh, at their website, and then I actually zoomed into that region, and I found they had the same guy as an average specifically there, and I found it in the original data. He actually had just been backpacking across Central Africa, <laughs> and he took a photo of himself in every place he went. <laughs> So this is like every different village he went to. He's like, here I am. And so the neural net kind of fell in love with his face. It was like, oh, whenever I see this guy, I know Central Africa. <laughs> really funny. So maybe you saw this also like slightly purple face here. So that's from Scandinavia. That also got me kind of wondering what's going on there. Turns out people in Scandinavia love nightclubs. <laughs> and they love using purple light <laughs> more than anywhere else in the world, apparently. So once the neural net sees some purple light, it instantly goes, oh, Scandinavia, I got you. <laughs> okay, who, who can guess what the most prototypical face for East Asia is? Anybody? No? Okay. <laughs> This was after I did some work to make sure this didn't happen again, because it turned out, you know, that one guy who was going through Central Africa, I, I was like, okay, look, everybody only gets one identity per user account, okay? So I'm only gonna count him once, right? And then we're gonna run the whole thing again and see what happens. But then, the Buddha comes up because everyone's taking photos of the same statues. <laughs> and then the same thing happened in the Middle East. In the Middle East, it's Jesus. <laughs> Most of these are from the Deisis mosaic of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which is like kind of hilarious that this ancient relic has now become the face of the Middle East for this modern machine learning algorithm. Okay, let's talk about text for a minute. When we were working with images, we have this fixed size uh, input and a fixed size output, right? This is exactly what a neural net's designed to process. Um, but when we're working with text, it's usually variable length. Uh, it can be a short sentence, a long sentence, we can be working with a paragraph, we can be working with a single word. Uh, so this requires a new kind of architecture that can operate on sequences of things rather than fixed size things. One solution to this is called a recurrent neural network. Um, and these recurrent networks predict one step of output at a time. Every time that you run the network, it produces the next step of output. So in this case, it's generating some handwriting, uh, like one time step at a time, controlling a pen that's moving around. Uh, in the case of text, it's going to generate a character at a time. In music, it's one note at a time. Or if you're predicting weather, it's one you know moment of the temperature at a time or something. In 2015, this uh, researcher, Andre Karpathy, who generated that Shakespeare that I read earlier, he released this toolkit called char RNN, which basically if you feed char RNN a couple megabytes of text, maybe like a few books worth of text, it'll start generating new text that's in the style of what you gave it. And it works for most 
everything, which is kind of incredible. So this code was really easy for a lot of people to experiment with, and Andre gave a bunch of examples of texts that he tried from different sources. So one of the things he trained on was Wikipedia, which is pretty funny, and naturalism and decision for the majority of Arab countries capitalized was grounded by the Irish language by John Clare, an imperial Japanese revolt. These are like links to other articles. So it's generating like articles that it thinks should exist. Um, he generated Linux kernel code by feeding all of the Linux source code in there. And it even generates like non-code, right? Anything it sees, it just imitates. So these are comments that the programmers would have written in this kind of code. Uh, I think this might even be syntactically correct, which is kind of amazing. Um, if you're familiar with other text generation techniques like Markov change, uh, chains, which were being used for MegaHAL that I mentioned at the beginning, Something you'll notice is that the recurrent net has a really good ability to balance syntactic correctness with new text. Normally with a Markov chain, you have to like balance. There's a trade-off between copying your source material directly and producing something that doesn't really make sense. This year, things got a little more incredible and kind of scary. There's this nonprofit in San Francisco called OpenAI that announced what's currently the state of the art in text generation. So I want to read this. It's uh, a little long. It'll take me maybe a minute, but I feel like you need to hear the whole thing to really understand what's going on. So this was the prompt that was provided. This is from a human, right? When you're doing these sequence generation algorithms, usually you give it a little bit of an intro, and it uses that as a seed to kind of set up its idea of what it's going to say next, OK? So a human wrote as like a prompt for what they want it to say. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. OK, so the sequence generation model, which it's not an RNN anymore. It's a different model called a transformer. But similar idea, we're generating sequences. It's going to pick up from there and continue, OK? The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. These four-horned silver-white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and several companions were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noticed that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. Perez and the others that ventured further into the valley by the time we reached the top of one peak, the water looked blue with some crystals on top, said Perez. Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close that they could touch their horns. While imagining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered examining. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language, something like a dialect or a dialectic. <laughs> Dr. Perez believes that the unicorns may have originated in Argentina, where the animals were believed to be descendants of a lost race of people who lived there before the arrival of humans in those parts of South America. <laughs> While their origins are still unclear, some believe that perhaps the creatures were created when a human and a unicorn met each other in a time before human civilization. According to Perez, in South America, such incidents seem to be quite common. <laughs> However, Perez also pointed out that it's likely the only way of knowing for sure if unicorns are indeed the descendants of a lost alien race <laughs> is through DNA. But they seem to be able to communicate in English quite well which I believe is a sign of evolution, or at least a change in social organization, said the scientist. What just happened? <laughs> OK, so no, notice the way it picked a Spanish name for the professor, right? There, there was no indication at the beginning of his name. Uh, but because it said Andes Mountains in that intro, it knew something about geography. It knew something about language. It knew something about culture. It knows Argentina is nearby. It mentioned that. Right? Um, it has its own ideas about how South American culture works. But this is really significant, I think, this breakthrough in February, uh, not just because it's funny to read this kind of surreal text written by bots, but because the same techniques that are used for generating this kind of text uh, are also used for analyzing text, for classifying it. Uh, the same way images are classified, 
text is also classified, right? To predict uh, sentiment or a source, like whether it's happy or sad, whether it was written by someone younger or older. Um, these same techniques are used for translation. So any of these improvements that come in the generation side are also applicable to all these other text-related um, problems. And it could have the generation side itself could have kind of a disastrous effect on society by, uh, I don't know, like, <laughs> mm, yeah, there's a lot of propaganda and disinformation already. I think just reducing the cost of that could be a problem. So while most of the algorithms we've discussed today have been avail made available to everybody through kind of open source initiatives and on GitHub, um, OpenAI very interestingly has decided to keep this one to themselves. And so they're only sharing their trained model, which took them you know, weeks to train on lots of computers and it was very expensive. They're keeping their trained model to themselves and only sharing it with a few researchers who are interested in trying to predict whether text was written by this bot or not, which kind of difficult. Then you get back into this GAN territory where once you're trying to outsmart something, all that will come of that is a better generator, right? So what's the end game here? It's not clear. All right, last media. I want to talk about sound for a second. Let's listen to this discussion with Samantha West. Hey. Hi, I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm calling about an online request you once made about health insurance coverage. Okay. We work with all major companies and compare... Hey, are you a robot? <laughs> what? No, I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's crazy. I see you just sound so much like a robot. <laughs> I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. Will you tell me you're not a robot? Just say I'm not a robot, please. I am a real person. I mean, I believe you, but will you just say, I'm not a robot? Come on. You can It'll make me feel better to hear you say it. <laughs> there is a live person here. <laughs> but it, okay, so it turns out it's true. They are a real person, but instead of speaking for themselves, they're pressing buttons that play pre-recorded messages. Some researchers discovered that we're way more likely to talk to someone that calls us if they have the same accent as us. So these call centers will use a lot of different recordings of people from different areas with different accents, depending on who they're calling. So in a way, there's kind of these multiple intelligences represented here. There's the people who recorded it originally, people who are pressing the buttons. There's a whole infrastructure around this. Um, it's this composite system that's kind of stretched over time and space, all the way from this original recording to the interactive playback. Um, and I think this breakdown of identity is one of the things that's most exciting for me about these um, uh, collaborative AI-based, ML-based system. That was an example of like pre-recorded speech, right? But speech synthesis itself has also come kind of a long way over the last few years. One interesting feature of these systems is that you can ask them to speak without anything to read, and they'll end up muttering something that sounds kind of like the language that they were trained on without making any sense. So this is an example from DeepMind in 2016. So that was trained on English, and that was its attempt to speak English without saying anything specific, which is kind of amazing. Um, and since then, Google has tied their speech synthesis systems into a lot of other products, um, including the Google Home devices, and something new that they debuted last year called Duplex, which I'm gonna play. This is also kind of a long video, but um, I think you need to get the same weird feeling from this that I got if you haven't seen this already. So let's say you wanna ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're gonna hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Is that a big Google conference? So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for our clients. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? 
at 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, I want to draw your attention to someone very specific here. This guy. <laughs> I can really relate to this guy's mood. <laughs> so <laughs> Google Duplex, this tech that they just demoed, has been in operation for over a year. But some journalists who are looking into this have reported that businesses get freaked out when they get this call. And it says, uh, yes, this is an automated call that will probably be recorded, um, but we'd like to make an appointment. And <laughs> I kind of wonder, well, they don't always talk to the voice, right? They just get freaked out and they hang up. But I wonder, like, is it just a matter of time until they find exactly the right voice where it's like, oh, yes, hello, uh, I'm calling to make an appointment. And you're like, oh, yeah, who's this? <laughs> Maybe they just need the right voice, right? Like right now the voice is limited to imitating whoever they can get into a sound studio for like a few a few dozen hours to record a lot of audio. But other researchers are working on voice transfer, so maybe that's the next step. Here's a research from Facebook imitating the voice of Bill Gates. Uh, write a fond note to the friend you cherish. We frown when events take a bad turn. <laughs> the intonation is very funny, right? But <laughs> the timbre is correct. So um, to kind of build up more of your intuition for what's going on in this like sound generation space, I want to play a little game called Bot or Not. We're going to listen to some music now, okay? I'm going to play a sound, a short section, maybe 15, 30 seconds. You're going to listen, and then I'm going to ask you whether it's a bot or not. Who says it's a bot? And who says not? OK, very cooperative audience. So turns out not. And a couple of people over here were right. It's an Irish folk tune called Butterfly. Let's try again. OK, bot, not. Uh, you're getting more skeptical, good. So, bot, you were correct. This is a fake tune called Jimmy O. Corlin by Joao Felipe Santos. Next one. OK, uh, who says bot? Yeah. Who says not? OK, still doing, you're, you're on it, you're on it. So that was, <laughs> that was uh, generated by IBM. <laughs> and I heard a lecture from these researchers who were describing like the process that went into this. And um, they uh, explained that it wasn't 100% a bot, but they gave it two things. One is they gave it a short melody, which was like the dun, 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 that was it. And then they gave it a guideline for how the song should sound. They said, it should sound amped. <laughs> Those are the two things they gave it. <laughs> OK, bot, not. Oh, you're slacking. So that was WaveNet again by DeepMind. Remember when we heard it kind of gibberish, like English? So this is gibberish piano. They gave it like hundreds of hours of piano and then said, play something, anything, whatever you feel like. It was all recorded from YouTube originally, which is why the audio quality sounds terrible. OK. <laughs> All right, bot, 
Yeah, now you're onto it. Okay. <laughs> Correct. That's Automatic Ping by Keith Fullerton Whitman. So I'm actually not totally sure about this one because I'm pretty sure he made it with like a few modular synths, and I'm not where that fits in this category, but let's continue. Uh, it was obviously very like finely crafted, and I think maybe we feel something about that in the music. Divided. That's uh, Experiments in Music and in Musical Intelligence by David Cope. That's a bot. But what's amazing about this one is from 1996. So he wasn't using any like neural networks. He was actually using something much more connected to the Markov chains that were going on in MegaHow. And he just spent years working on his algorithms and feeding it lots of Chopin. <laughs> Okay, bot, not, woo, gotcha. <laughs> That's Music Transformer, last year from uh, some researchers at Google, actually. And when I heard this, I was very surprised. <laughs> but the more I listen to it, the more I'm reminded of uh, Ovid's horn <laughs> and the Andes unicorns. Um, I really recommend if you if music means a lot to you to go spend some time looking at Music Transformer because um, I think uh, you might hear some of the same things that you read in or that I read to you from that uh, GPT-2 generative text from OpenAI. You might hear some of that kind of rambling. You might hear some of that um, kind of misdirection, like things that don't really fit into previous themes. But somehow, in the context of music, it's kind of OK sometimes, right? And makes it even more interesting in some cases. So I've been asking myself this question a lot, too, which is, when is human authorship non-essential? I actually kind of like that last one. I don't know if I listen to it a lot, but it would kind of be nice to have in the background in some cases, right? I don't know that it's always important to me that art or culture comes from a human all the time, like not for everything. Some things are fine if they're design or decorative. Um, I don't need to know that there was a person behind it. Maybe if it's like a personal story or some heartfelt like singer songwriter thing, if someone tells me later like, oh yeah, that was a bot, I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'm not, I, that, it doesn't mean the same thing to anymore, right? Um, like if someone told me tomorrow that, uh, you know, like my favorite, indie alternative rock band from the 90s was actually like generated by IBM, then I'd be very sad. But if someone told me like actually Chopin was um, like a book that Mozart wrote that was generative and then it turns out it was only realized like a hundred, few hundred years later, I'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Actually, I still love the music, right? It's weird that it's generative, but still means a lot to me and it makes me feel something. Um, so I think everyone's gonna have a different answer to this question of when is human authorship non-essential? Maybe for you, uh, like it's really important that the food that you love is made by someone that's special to you. And for me, maybe it just needs to be good food. And I don't care who made it, whether it was a robot or what. Um, sorry, I'm in Barcelona. I have to be <laughs> careful about talking about food. But <laughs> anyway, I don't think there's a single answer to this question. It's really big, but I think it's important for anyone who cares about art and culture to re reflect on this a bit and see where is it for you that human authorship is essential. Um, okay, we're going to wrap it up now, and then we'll have a little time for questions. Easiest place to start, if you want to do something that's kind of technical and you have some familiarity with like plugging different apps together on your computer, I really recommend Runway ML. Um, 
it's a great system that has a lot of the um, neural net based models already built into it uh, for things like generating faces and processing videos to do object detection, segmentation, um, and it has a really good interface for taking the results of those analysis and then feeding it into another app, like via OSC or to something in the browser with like Socket IO. Um, if any of that means something to you, then like start with this. This is a really good place. Um, if you're more interested in the kind of like getting things to move around and respond to their environment thing, um, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to say it again. Uh, ML Agents for Unity, it's kind of a plugin for Unity that lets you um, sort of automatically determine what the brain of your creatures should be based on some goals that you set. Remember, reinforcement learning is just what you do when you have a goal, but you don't have examples, right? You can describe what needs to happen, but not how it happens. This is great for making things that walk and run and lumber around and um, play games that you need NPCs for. If you want to get into some code or just stick with the browser, if you're really happy with like HTML and JavaScript, um, I really recommend ml5.js, which is a wrapper around another toolkit called tensorflow.js, which is a uh, kind of port of TensorFlow, which is a Python machine learning library from Google that a lot of these machine learning algorithms are written in or they're ported to once they're kind of solidified. So ML5.js is a really easy way to get started with um, things like object detection and uh, it's basic classification and regression from like a webcam. Um, and then one of the best ways to learn ML5 is to check out this guy, Dan Schiffman, who has a YouTube channel called Coding Train. And he's super fun to watch and makes you feel like you can do anything because um, he's got a really like uh, good vibe. So he'll, he'll walk you through basically everything that you could possibly want to do with machine learning in the browser with ML5. Next step up, there's a bunch of APIs out there. So if, if you're comfortable with like pretty much any programming language, then there's probably some way in that programming language to make a request to an external service on the web, right? Um, and there's a bunch of them. So Microsoft has some that are super advanced for doing all kinds of facial analysis. So this is the example that pops up when you go to their site, which is like a little weird, but it gives you a feeling of what's going on. So it, you upload this image and it gives you these three squares and then this is like the result that it gives you back in code. It tells you where those squares are. It does the face detection, right? The first step to draw the box around the faces. Then it does the analysis, like, you know, some properties of the person's hair and that's all I have on the screen right now. N probably not bald, not invisible hair, which could be like if they had a hat or something, it's not magical. Uh, <laughs> and their hair color is blonde, so probably it's talking about this person. Uh, and maybe their hair's red, probably not brown. So you get that kind of data back from Microsoft. They have other APIs as well. Google has a bunch of APIs. I really want to see someone play with this one. This is like a handwriting recognition API. So you can feed in an image that's as like, sort of natural as this, and it will give you back like a optical character recognition on your handwriting. And this is just one of a bunch of different uh, APIs they have. Some of these things you could train yourself, like some of the face analysis stuff. Um, but like this handwriting one, I don't even know how to get started on that. For me, I spend most of my time working in Python these days, and sometimes open frameworks for kind of connecting with a camera in real time. Uh, a lot of researchers prototype ideas for machine learning in this interactive development environment called a notebook. One of these most popular notebook systems is called Jupyter, the PY for Python and it can run locally on your machine. So if you've got a laptop that you want to like do some machine learning development on, then that's one way to do it, is to install Jupyter and then start kind of experimenting in this like cell-based way. If you've used like a patching environment before, like Max or VVVV or anything else, Touch Designer, then maybe you're familiar with this feeling of like, okay, I'm not compiling and running and modifying and compiling and running and modifying. You know, it's this continuous feedback cycle, right? And that's a lot what the Jupyter notebooks feel like for Python, because you run one chunk of code, and then it gives you some output, and then you add another chunk of code, and it all exists in the same kind of software code space. So this chunk down here can use variables from that one up there, 
and functions from, you know, that you wrote 20 minutes ago, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, this feels really comfortable compared to, you know, the sort of compile and run loop that most programming is. And if you don't have a laptop that you want to do this on, or you don't have a GPU, or it's not, your computer's not fast enough, Google has a service called Colab, or Collaboratory, where they provide free GPU access um, for up to 12 hour period, and then the machine restarts and you get another 12 hours. So you can't do like a really long term uh, training session on there where you're processing thousands of images, but or millions of images, but you can process thousands of images. And so that's a good place to start um, if you want to work with like Python and don't want to make the investment of like buying a new GPU. In, still in Python land, scikit-learn is a really great library. A lot of the stuff I talked at the very beginning about like regression and classification and k-means clustering, scikit-learn has implementations of all of those things in a way that's super accessible really easy and well laid out. They have a nice diagram on their site, which is like, if you're getting into machine learning and you don't know, what algorithm do I need for this problem? They even walk you through it. They're like, OK, let's go. Do you have more or less than 50 samples, like 50 data points? OK, if not, get more data. <laughs> but if you do, are you predicting a category? Remember, that was one of the first things I said. We're either doing classification or regression. Predicting a category? Let's say yes. Do you have labeled data? No. Well, this is our one of our unsupervised things, right, clustering. Yes, this is one of our supervised things, the classifiers. Anyway, so it continues, and it basically walks you through, like, pretty much which cl class to use. Like, these are just classes within their library. You can follow this diagram and work it out yourself. It's great. So when I'm working with faces, I use another tool called Dlib a lot. And in this case, I was building a tool to quantify how similar all the faces in a photo are. <laughs> it found something amazing. It found that this person is the one outlier in this photo where they were passing legislation about abortion in the US. OK, and when I'm working with sound, I use another tool called Librosa. This one provides the building blocks for feeding sound into other algorithms, like dimensionality reduction algorithms. If you've got like a million sounds and you want to lay them out in some big 3D space, then first you're going to pass them through Librosa, and then you're going to pass them through Scikit-Learn. Does that make sense? OK, last tool. So I didn't say this up to this point, but basically all of the deep learning research, all of these like convolutional networks, the recurrent neural networks, transformer, like with music transformer, all of this stuff is done these days in basically these two toolkits, TensorFlow and PyTorch. PyTorch is made by Facebook. TensorFlow is made by Google. TensorFlow is uh, a lot more mature than PyTorch in some ways, but PyTorch is way more fun to program because it's a lot more interactive. Um, if you already feel comfortable with programming and maybe even have some mathematics or computer vision background, uh, I would recommend jumping into PyTorch. There's a lot of fun examples out there. If you're just getting started, there's this kind of subset of TensorFlow called Keras, which does all of the neat things that happen inside Runway ML and that you do in the browser with ML5. It does it really easily. Keras is like super easy to program, and you can just write a convolutional network in five or 10 lines of code. Um, so that would be the place to start if you're just getting started. And I don't recommend TensorFlow. <laughs> all right, some questions. I think you have a mic over here. Thank you for the inspiring speech. What do you think could happen uh, in the Google example if both sides are uh, uh, a bot? So uh, oh. the client. <laughs> it would probably bot. just work, you know, no problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, boring answer, but I think uh, that's what Google's banking on. Yeah, that eventually it'll all just be bots. Thank you. <laughs> There's a question down here. Hi. Uh, a very interesting speech and great presentation. Uh, I would like to ask about the thing about agency in mm -hmm. these things. Because uh, recently, I mean, there has been a lot of things about fake news and making these fake worlds and fake uh, information spheres and then putting people inside these information spheres. How do you think like democratizing these kind of uh, like technologies could affect? Because I mean, I use Runway ML as well. And recently there was like this, uh, I think Gene Kogan, he tweeted about a fake, new, a fake news generator. Mm -hmm. And I was playing and I was like, wow, it is generating. And I sent it to my friends and they were like, how is this even happening? Yeah. And so, I mean, how do you, what is your point of view on that? What I got from your question is, um, 
how do we reestablish our agency in the midst of all of this stuff that's happening? And I think you actually answered it, which is um, it's basically about uh, education and experimentation that all of us have to work with these tools. We have a responsibility as creative people to basically take these, reimagine them, misuse them, you know, modify them, understand them as deeply as it makes sense for us, and then imagine some future that we want them to exist in, right? Uh, because if we don't do that, then this force kind of gets put on top of us. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to talk about this, is I feel like this is one part I can play in sort of sharing some ideas about what's happening here. I think that's the only answer, is basically build up a community of people that are excited about working with these things in a way that goes against the grain of what you're being told they're supposed to be used for. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Um, First, that was super interesting. Second, that was super scary. <laughs> um, where do you see the limit of that? Because uh, it evolves a lot in the last few, mm. few years. And as I said, that's super scary for the next few years. And do you think that governments should create laws to control that way, mm. and if it's possible to control that? very difficult. Um, I would hope that m the laws that we have already should be able to control these things. And if they can't, then we don't need to, we shouldn't be legislating specifically against this technology. We should figure out fundamentally what's broken with our society and fix it there. But maybe we can't do that fast enough. I think in the US we have some different way of working around these things than in Europe. So if I gave a real answer to that, I think it would have to be very regional. I don't know what the answer is here. I think in the US, probably we will legislate against it. Like just in San Francisco, we made it illegal to, for uh, cops to use face recognition. And I think actually some places here in Europe, it's the same way. That's one approach. Um, I think there's another side of your question, which is like, what's the limit, right? Um, there's a few ways to answer that. Like, what's the limit of um, sort of uh, complexity or how impressive these things can be? Or what's the limit of the creative algorithms? Like, will they ever be as artful as humans? Will we ever care about the output as much? And I think um, I can't put I can't put a limit on the, you know, how good the next text generator is going to be. I don't see a clear limit there. But I do see in everybody that like listens to music or loves art, I do see some limit in ourselves of what we're willing to accept right, of like, oh, I don't like that because it was made by a bot, right? Or maybe more historically, like, oh, this is not going to be shown in my museum because it was made by a woman, right? There's long history of us, like, excluding people and perspectives. I don't want to, like, say these are the same thing, like, ignoring women and ignoring bots, right? But uh, I do want to say that uh, we have a really good tendency to... Um, not be open to new perspectives. And I think if there's a limit in terms of the creative expressivity of these systems, it might be in ourselves in terms of what we accept and what inspires us. I hope that answers your question. Hi. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a question off, off piece. Humpback whales, yeah. this project you worked on, how does this stuff even begin to happen with Google? And, yeah, that's and, a good and question. What's the, what's, is there a goal? So I showed two projects early on that I did in collaboration with Google. One was this synthesizer that uses machine learning to generate weird sounds. The other one is uh, um, kind of analysis of humpback whale songs. Basically, uh, I am, so I don't work for Google, right? I have a company that contracts for Google, and that's when they see something I've done that they're excited about promoting somehow, or they want my creative or technical insight on something they're trying to do. Um, the reason that relationship exists is because I have friends that I've worked on on art projects with, former students, um, colleagues in like technical communities that work there and they get in touch with me. Um, that's the way that connection starts. The reason that it's sustained is because, uh, well, two reasons. One is um, it's in Google's interest to make things that make machine learning not look scary, right? 
every time that something comes out that's like, oh, it's a synth powered by machine learning, everyone's like, oh yeah, we forgot about all the scary stuff. That's so cool, right? And that's perfect for them. That's what they're trying to go for. And the other reason is that I don't say fuck Google enough for them to not work with me, right? So I'm personally, I try and ride some line in between so that I can understand how they work and make money off of them, sustain myself, but then also, with that understanding, kind of redirect my critique as poignantly as possible, right? That's my line. I'm not saying everyone should do that. I have friends who are also like, I'm never touching a Google product. I have so much respect for that, too. So um, that's sort of how those collaborations start and evolve. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>